Oh my, even with binoculars, I can see alien galaxies millions and millions of light years away from my own backyard. Hello, everybody. I'm Stargazer Mark, always getting a thrill to look in my backyard at, at the celestial sites. And today we're going to stay star curious on Stay Curious, we're talking about galaxies that you can see in your own backyard. Glad that you joined us as the American Space Museum every Monday brings you some backyard astronomy tips from me, Mark Marquette. I've been a stargazer all my life since eight years old. I have no memories of not having a telescope and wanting to point it up at the beautiful sky. And what we're looking at here tonight is the legendary uh, Hubble Space Telescope uh, Legacy Deep Space Image. And this is an image we're going to talk about in a little bit as we talk about three constellations. The beast in the sky, Leo the lion, is rising in the east. So beautiful. And trailing behind it is Virgo, the, the maiden. And then uh, to the north is the uh, Big Dipper is very visible, standing on its handle. But that's just the hindquarters of Ursa Major, the big bear. All of this area of the sky as we look out on a night, clear night like tonight, is looking outside of our galaxy. It's like looking out the window, the back window of the car, and the front of the car is headed into the center of our Milky Way galaxy. That's what we see in the summertime when we're looking at stars, or stars that are, are close to the center of the Milky Way. But during the springtime, we're actually looking outside in the furthest, like an opening in our galaxy. And, and we can see incredible numbers of galaxies. Even with binoculars, you can see a good 25 to 40 galaxies, if you know where to look, with star charts and, of course, a red flashlight. So uh, the red flashlight is so your eyes do not uh, contract back to a small pupil after they dilate. So I'm going to get set up here. Marty Winkle, my cameraman, co-producer, he's asking if everybody can hear you well out there. So Dave Stangy, you're probably watching, or Larry P Pushkar. Thank you for chirping in there. Uh, Robert Law, that our audio is okay for today. Uh, and we are going to kick off here our little alien galaxy talk by showing you a picture of the zodiac. The 12 constellations of the zodiac mark the circle of the sky through which the sun, moon, and planets all travel. And it is the backdrop against this that the Earth sees its stars, okay? And if you look at this, sign, at, at this chart, uh, we are, of course, in, let's say we're at March right there. We're actually in April, between March and June. But when you're looking at March, we're looking at Virgo, Leo, Libra. We're looking out away from our the center of our galaxy. And we cannot see Pisces or Aries or Taurus because they are interfering in Aquarius because you see the sun from March to September, you have to look across the sun. That is the daytime sky. So the daytime is filled with the autumn constellations right now, so we can't see them. So uh, as we go around the sun, it's like looking at the grandstands of a sporting event or a car race as you're looking up. Right now, we're between the backstretch and turn three, so to speak, if turn four was September and, and uh, uh October, November's the other end there. So uh, we got thumbs up from Marty on the audio. So thank you very much there. Robert, Robert Law. Thank you, Robert. And uh, uh, so our astronomy program today is to emphasize that this is the time of the year to see galaxies and astrophotographers that do a lot of photo that are excited for this time because they can photograph worlds that contain billions of stars just like our Milky Way galaxy. And just in the closest stars around our Milky Way galaxy, we found 5,000 exoplanets circling other stars. So as, as you look at some of these images of these galaxies, a lot of these galaxies are larger than our Milky Way galaxy. And of course, they're going to have uh, stars, uh, the stars that have planets going around them, just like we have here in our own Milky Way. Well, let's see, the zodiac sign there, um, 
to emphasize that the, the, the sky is filled with stars that look like stars, but they're actually galaxies. Here's another Hubble image, and the IC is the International Catalog of Galaxies, and NGC is New General Catalog of Galaxies. And every one of these little star points there is a galaxy, but it's not distinguished with its spiral arms or, or, or other features that galaxies have because they're so far, far away. But alien galaxies in your backyard that you can find, we start with the constellation Leo the Lion. Leo is one of these constellations that's been known since antiquity. In antiquity, we're talking five to 6,000 years ago when the astronomers in the birth of cradle of civilization that we call Mesopotamia started looking up and assigning names to these patterns of stars like a dot to dot. Leo is one that pretty much looks like it's supposed to look like in the sky, like a beast in the sky. His hindquarters are distinctive three stars that make a right triangle. And the head of Leo is a backward question mark or a scythe. Only Marty and I might know what a scythe is. That's a, a, a curved, uh, sharp uh, blade that cuts hay or wheat on there. Uh, or it's a backward question mark with its brightest star is called Regulus, the regal star. Now, this was a very important house in uh, Jewish history because it was the house of the Hebrew where decisions were made. In uh, four years before the birth of Jesus, uh, the planet Mercury, the planets Jupiter and Saturn merged, Venus, I mean, Jupiter and Venus merged as one star near Regulus. So, very important. Here's another outline, star map, different look of, of uh, with the names given of the stars. Regulus, the brightest star is Alpha, then Beta, uh, Omega, Centauri, on down the line there. I mean, um, uh, I don't know my Greek alphabet, Beta, Theta, what else, Marty? Uh, uh, Iota. Gamma, Phi. Gamma, Phi, exactly. So that's that's why you see Epsilon, that's why you see the Greek alphabet there, is uh, instead of naming the stars, they gave them a Greek alphabet later to keep letter to uh, denote them when you're talking shop to another astronomer. Well, the nebula literally is translated to tail of the lion, and that's what the, the final star in there. Well, you see the M66, 65, M105. The M stands for an astronomer named Charles Messier, who in the 1800s had a pretty big telescope. By today's standards, it'd just be mediocre. He had about an 8-inch reflector that he was looking for comets. And comets in a telescope of that size look just like a faint, fuzzy little cotton ball, if you will, in the sky. But when they move, you know that they're a comet. And comets were not well understood, and Messier was going to catalog them and try to understand them. But he kept seeing these faint, fuzzy little objects in his telescope, little gray, gray balls of, of, of hair or like little ball, cotton balls that didn't move from night to night. And he didn't know what they were, so he just gave them a number and went on. That's why many of them close to each other have similar numbers. 96 and 95 were discovered on the same night. But then a month later, when the full moon was out of the way and Messier was observing stars, he... Uh, uh, found 105, another one near it. So uh, the M objects, the Messier objects, are the faint, fuzzy galaxies, nebula, and star clusters. About 105 of them, and that's where you cut your teeth in amateur astronomy is learning these Messier objects. They're a, a treasure chest up there. Of, 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 and, but when you put a telescope on them, Wow, this is what you see. This is M65, M66, and what on the left is called the Hamburger Galaxy, NGC 3628. Now, those are right over here. Okay, C66 and 65 there. All right, well, they're, they're the ones at the top two, and the one to the left is, is the, is the non-Messier object that he didn't see that. And he probably didn't because it's sideways and the luminosity is not as bright as the other stars there. What's the guidance there? Hmm? Guidance there. Oh, well, that, okay, that's, well, that, the circular up the top, there's M65. To the, no, that's just a regular star. 
That's the Galaxy M65, and below it's M66. And these are billions of stars, just like our Milky Way. Now, to emphasize how far we have come in just 100 years, a man named Hubble was the first guy to say in 1900s, 120 years ago, that you know what? I think there's other galaxies outside our Milky Way. The Milky Way was thought as the whole universe at the time. And then Hubble, with other astronomers at the great 200-inch Hale Telescope, and first the 100-inch at Mount Wilson, were taking photos. The photography was just coming online, and they started seeing structures in these fuzzy objects. And then they realized by their redshift or some a technical term of how fast they're moving that these were far beyond our galaxy. So the telescope named the Hubble telescope after Edwin Hubble. His discovery was that, hey, we are not the, all the universe. There are other galaxies out there with even more stars than our galaxy. And this was a quite a revelation. Uh, so not only is it a revelation now, but the revelation keeps coming because these, these galaxies nearby have now we found that wherever we look are galaxies of billions and billions of stars. And in a moment, I'm going to uh, uh, blow you away with, well, I already have. These are, are over, over uh, 3,000 galaxies are in this picture, okay? And we're seeing ones that go back every little speck in here is a galaxy, and we're seeing ones that are 13 billion light years away, just a billion years after the dawn of the universe. And this is what the new telescope that we put up, called the Webb Telescope, is gonna be able to see the exact edges of all these telescopes, all, all these here. Now you can see the spiral structure of that one. That one looks like a line. The one behind it's a galaxy, galaxies everywhere. None, the only star in this frame is the one with the cross on it, Marty, in the center. And that, those, that cross on the star is caused by the spikes of the telescope. There it is, right there in the middle. Mm -hmm. Those spikes there cause, that's an artifact of the Hubble telescope. All right, the secondary mirror that's suspended between the, the nine foot mirror there. So everything else in here, there's no stars. They're all galaxies, all right? And this was an area of the Milky Way that we thought was empty. When we looked at it with our binoculars at night, it looked like there was nothing there. And so an astronomer with his time says, well, I'm going to just kind of risk it that there could be something there. And they took over... Uh, uh, 342 exposures of what was seemingly a nondescript part of, of Ursa Major, this result would turn astronomy on its head. Such deep exposures reveal thousands of galaxies in a relatively small apparent part of the sky. In fact, this part of the sky represented here is only the size of the moon in the sky. And like I said, the moon's a half a degree. 380 moons could go from the horizon stacked on end to end to directly overhead, 90 degrees. So everywhere we look, we are seeing galaxies, galaxies, galaxies. And not only that, these galaxies clump together by gravity into super clusters we'll talk about here in just a minute. So we hope that you're enjoying a little bit of Staying Star Curious on Stay Curious Today. Please tell your friends to check us out on YouTube. Uh, and, uh, of course, Facebook Live and uh, Twitch and Spotify. And tell your friends to share, subscribe, and, and uh, uh, share, subscribe, like, and sub uh, something else there. I, I forget. I've been under the moonshine too much. And now that, that it's cleared up, we're looking at galaxies. I'm getting really spaced out here. So bear with me. But here's another image of a backyard astronomy. Uh, 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 this is a Hubble telescope image, a beautiful image of galaxies in Leo again. Uh, the spikes are, are by the artifacts of the telescope itself, all right? Uh, that's not a Hubble telescope image. That's actually a very good backyard astronomy image. And when we're looking at galaxies, some we're seeing edge on, some we're seeing sideways. Look at that S object up there. 
Well, I'll bet that if we looked at it from the left looking down on it, it's a spiral with its arms going above and below the plane of the spiral there. So, so much to conjecture, so much to wonder about. But this is a close-up of one of these these galaxies there, the one on the far right by the Hubble telescope. Now we're starting to see individual stars inside a galactic core of stars. And pretty much every galaxy we look at has a black hole at the center in that bright area in there. That's not the black hole. That is the energy being created by the matter falling into the black hole. Let me get a little coffee here. Uh, caution may randomly start talking about astronomy is what my mug says there. So, so uh, cheers to Dan Vranick out there taking great images in his backyard in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Dan. Seen some of his work lately, and my good friend Greg Shotland, stargazed with him as a teenager. He's at the John Glenn, uh, uh, observe, uh, John Glenn Park doing a lot of stargazing. But you can't do this from your backyard. You need the Hubble telescope to look at this. Now, what's going to happen, Marty, is the Hubble telescope is taking this image, then the Webb telescope is going to take another similar image like this that will look, the Webb telescope looks at infrared light. So it's going to be able to look behind clouds and see what is behind that bright area there. What is fueling that black hole? What mysteries are going to be there? Because the Hubble, the Webb, while well, the Hubble telescope is an optical visual telescope, the web is infrared, much like a police camera that can see the criminals' bodies inside the house, or you've seen those from a helicopter where they're following somebody running in a backyard. That is what the web telescope is going to see, to be able to see behind buildings, so to speak, at the heat signature of stars and what's going on with them. As, I, as you catch me looking up to the sky here, I'm looking up at our big screen TV, and I should be looking at my monitor here, but I love looking up. You all know that. Here's another Hubble telescope image of the core of a galaxy uh, that we don't understand a whole lot about, and then they will uh, put the Webb telescope on that, and it'll actually be able to see behind the, those clouds and, and into the deep part of this galaxy's core. So hard to emphasize how what a just a moat we are out there in the universe when you start looking at these galaxy pictures. Well, here, of course, we're going to talk briefly now about the other galaxies that you can see from your own backyard. Get you a star chart. All right. Have your red flashlight handy so you can uh, see the objects uh, uh, in the sky with a chart and it doesn't hurt your night vision, the red light. And you can see where galaxies are off on uh, the Big Dipper. Like there at the end of the Dipper, you see M51. M51 is a very famous galaxy there. Uh, up at the top at the pointer stars of Dubai and Merrick, you see M82 and M81, all right, and NGC 2077, new general catalog. You put that on against a, sty a, a sky chart, and then it's easy to figure out where some of these are. And so you put your, your, t your binoculars on them. And these galaxies, you can see all 105 Messier object galaxies with binoculars, yeah, but uh, just barely. And so your backyard telescope, even the cheapest one you find, you can find these, these two galaxies uh, in the Ursa Major. All right, they are uh, 12 million light years from Earth, okay? 12 million years ago, the light left from these galaxies and are hitting our eyes in our own backyards. Isn't that something to think about? Let me go to the next one. Oh, there we go. That's what's called the Owl Nebula. That is a, a not a galaxy, but it's a star that blew up. And as you can see, it's got little owl eyes on it like. So uh, and these are from my astronomy friend, Mark Poole, who took these from his light polluted backyard in India Atlantic. All right. Over by Melbourne uh, and astrophotographers. Pardon me. Melbourne, Florida. Yep. Melbourne, Florida, not Melbourne, Australia. Marty wants to remind you. Yes, these are taken in full Florida and light polluted skies. And what they do, 
astronomers today in their backyards with about a $5,000 telescope and a $5,000 camera set up. And you could a little bit lower than that for some. But uh, they take a series of 90-second exposures, a minute and a half. And they'll do that 10 times. So a minute and a half exposures 10 times suddenly becomes what? A 15-minute exposure like in your black when you combine them in Photoshop. So very easy to, to uh, it's a tedious process, a lot of computer time. I like the old school and have sketched a lot of these galaxies. We're going to go to Virgo. All right, you follow the handle of the Big Dipper. The first star you see is Arcturus tonight. And then this next star you see when you follow the curve of the handle is Spica in Virgo. The Virgin Lady, the, the maiden up in the sky. Another ancient constellation that's been around since uh, 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 2,000 years before Christ, okay, 2,000 years B.C., uh, a lot Leo and, and Virgo and uh, Ophiuchus and Scorpius and Sagittarius were all kind of figured out by the ancients, and those patterns were adopted by the European cultures, uh, the Greeks and the Romans mostly, that gave them their name. But that's why a lot of these stars have uh, Arabic-type names from the Arab astronomers. Well, it looks kind of like a, a long body of a, a woman laying down, very indistinct stars in Virgo. The whole constellation is really hard to trace out because most of the stars uh, are second magnitude or fainter, with Spica being a, a bright first magnitude star. But you see the M49, M60, M87 up by that, by that star called uh, Ven Venderomix. And their Coma Bernices is the hair of... Queen Bernices, and there's a lot of galaxies, and this whole area contains galaxies everywhere you look. And this is to show you a section of our universe where the galaxies have clumped together, all right? You see it, the Hercules supercluster, Centaurus supercluster, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So in areas of our universe, galaxies have clumped together in noticeable patterns that have been investigated by, by not only Earth-bound telescopes, but satellites all over. So gravity attracts even gigantic super galaxies. And guess what's happening, Marty, is our Milky Way galaxy is uh, just oh, five or six billion years away from colliding with the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy is the furthest object you can see in your with your naked eye. It's two and a half million light years away. It's right now setting uh, in uh, uh, Andromeda in our western sky, very prominent in the winter and fall. And uh, it is attracted to us and we're going to merge one day. But the stars are so far apart that our night sky will hardly change at all when that incredible event happens. Such are the distances of stars between each other. All right, Marty, we've been talking about billions and billions of light years and back in time. And, and it's, it's not all easy to digest, but uh, to make it simple is... We are in a vast universe that has more stars than the grains of sand on all the oceans of the beaches of the world. I was on the beach this weekend. That's hard to imagine. But yes, it's a fact because you, you can't imagine how much a million is, let alone a billion. Our Milky Way galaxy alone, we think, has 100 billion stars. And just within the closest... Uh, 2,000 stars, we have found 5,000 planets orbiting them. Those 5,000 planets, they're orbiting about 1,000 stars or 850 stars. Everywhere we look, we not only see stars, we see planets orbiting stars. And then when we get out of our own Milky Way galaxy, we see this, thousands of stars in areas that we thought were empty. So what an incredible universe that we live in. That's why man must explore even from your own backyard, the satisfaction of just looking up there and seeing these faint fuzzies do your own. They just look like a little faint fuzzy, but then you go uh, and look on your laptop 
or dig out a book and see the uh, uh, actual what it looks like in a photograph. So, well, we appreciate G. Uh, Scott Polk, thank you for watching in Hobart, Australia. And Carrie Fink, thank you. And Robert Law. And uh, we know that many of you are watching today from all over. And uh, there's, there's two people where it's night already looking at night. So they're going to go out and see if I'm right. All right. Get outside, Robert and Scott Polk there. Pete who? Pete. Oh, oh, hi, Keith Sewell. <laughs> Professor Sewell is out there. All right, we're good. He knows what I'm talking about, how vast this universe is, because he's an astronomy teacher. It's unfathomable, folks, but don't let that bother you. Go out in your backyard, get you a nice beverage and a little bit of a snack, get in that lawn chair, have your star chart with your red, red flashlight so that you can look all night long and if that neighbor's light they won't shut off that backyard light we'll move in a different spot and block it with your garage and so forth so until then marty i'm gonna go back to doing a little backyard stargazing here staying star curious with me mark marquette i can't wait to see you again to keep you stay stay to keep you star curious on stay curious and bridging the space between us oh boy that looks beautiful <laughs>